Good morning, everyone. It's uh, actually good afternoon, everyone. It's wonderful to have you uh, joining me today. And we at Grace Covenant Church, uh, we're here to read a psalm together and pray together. Uh, so let's begin with prayer. Kind and merciful Father, I just uh, thank you again for life today. Here in Washington State, it's beautiful out, sunny skies, spring in full bloom today. But around the world, Lord, the people you created are hurting. In the U.S., there's now about 400,000 cases of COVID-19. With over 12,000 deaths, Lord, there's mourning going around on in your world all over the planet, Lord. Just about every country has been touched by this. And so again, we call out to you, Lord. We ask for your intervention. We ask that you would stand up from your throne. But at the same time, I can't help but get the feeling that maybe we're not waiting on you, but you're waiting on us as a world. You're waiting on us to cry out to you. You're waiting on us to once again turn from our hardened hearts. And look to you, Lord. I know that I read in the CDC this morning, Lord, that the peak is coming around April 14th, so another seven days. And the death toll is going to continue to rise. Families around the world are continue to experience this shock of, of loss and grief. And I want to ask why, Lord, but maybe we don't need to know the answer to why. But maybe with one voice, with all those hearing my voice now and later, we cry out to you, Lord. How long, O oh Lord, how long? I know at the same time, beyond the virus and beyond the pandemic, there are lots of stresses in our life, stresses that were there before any of this began. And so I remember those things too, Lord. Relational stress and strife in families. Addiction, which is on the rise now, even in this pandemic. They're predicting a huge rise in alcoholism and addiction. Homelessness. And people out of jobs. And people without food on the table. And then we have all of our health issues going on. Many of us struggling either with pain and arthritis and those kinds of maladies or struggling with illness, Lord. And so we come to you not put together, not strong. Our pride now shattered. Our self-reliance now coming to an end. And I pray along with Jesus, Father, forgive them, for, know not, for they know not what they do. Father, forgive this world, for they know not what they do. And in our own lives, Lord, you be our strength. 
you be the one who is our vanguard, the shield about us, our strong tower, or as Jeremiah puts it, our wall of fire, a wall of fire all about, all around us. May we be lights in the midst of this darkness, Lord. Father, you are revealing the consequences of human greed. Lord, we wait on you as you are waiting on us. Thank you for this week, Lord, in which we remember Palm Sunday and then the trial of the Pharisees and scribes and chief priests all seeing if they could find any fault with you, just as they were looking at the lambs in the temple, looking for any blemish. But they found you innocent, Lord. And yet those same crowds who shouted Hosanna on Sunday, on Friday were shouting, crucify him, crucify him. And we too in that throng. Thank you that you love this world, Lord. Thank you that you love us. that your mercies and compassions are new every morning, that the power of your grace knows no bounds. That your love is broader and deeper and higher and wider than we can ever imagine. We thank you that in your own being, you are love. You don't just love, but you are in your very character and your essential being. You are love, and we give you praise for that. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, a built-in relationship into the very being of God. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for loving this old, tired world. Stand up, O oh Lord. Stand up. We cry out to you. Stand up, O oh Lord. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, it's uh, very nice to have you here today. I've really enjoyed doing these psalms. Um, psalm 10 is not the easiest psalm. It's a psalm of judgment a psalm against the evildoers, against those who are wicked. And so I'm going to go ahead and read through Psalm 10, and then we'll start back over and uh, just to do some uh, reflection on it as we go re read it a second time. Psalm 10. This psalm has no uh, introduction to it. it. They think it's a psalm of David. They actually think it's like part two of Psalm 9, very similar themes and there's uh, appearance that uh, each line began with a different letter. And this one starts with Lamed, which was uh, well into the alphabet, the Hebrew alphabet. And so uh, it's not perfect, but uh, it appears that Psalm 9 was the first part and Psalm 10 is the second part. So this may very well be a Psalm of David, but even that we're not sure about. So here the reading of Psalm 10. Why do you stand afar off, O Lord? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? In pride, the wicked hotly pursue the afflicted. Let them be caught in the plots which they have devised. For the wicked boasts of his heart's desires, and the greedy man curses and spurns the Lord. The wicked, in the haughtiness of his countenance, does not seek him, all his thoughts are, there is no God. His ways prosper at all times. Your judgments are on, are on high, out of his sight. 
As for all of his adversaries, he snorts at them. He says to himself, I will not be moved. Throughout all generations, I will not be in adversity. His mouth is full of curses and deceit and oppression. Under his tongue is mis mischief and wickedness. He sits in the lurking places of the villages. In the hiding places, he kills the innocent. His eyes stealthily watch, stealthily watch for the unfortunate. He lurks in a hiding place as a lion in his lair. He lurks to catch the afflicted. He catches the afflicted when he draws him into his net. He crouches, he bows down, and the unfortunate fall by his mighty ones. He says to himself, God has forgotten. He is hidden his face, he will never see it. Arise, O Lord, O God, lift up your hand. Do not forget the afflicted. Why has the wicked spurned God? He has said to himself, you will not require it. You have seen it, for you have beheld mischief and vexation to take it into your hand. The unfortunate commits himself to you. You have been the helper of the orphan. Break the arm of the wicked and the evildoer. Seek out his wit wickedness until you find none. The Lord is king forever and ever. Nations have perished from his hand. O Lord, you have heard the desire of the humble. You will strengthen their heart. You will incline their ear to vindicate the orphan and the oppressed, so that the man who is of the earth will no longer cause terror. May the Lord bless the reading of his psalm today. So again, um, Psalm 10 is a, is a song of lament to God, and it's a psalm also a, a call to judgment. So let's begin. Why do you stand off, or why do you stand afar off, O Lord? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? What uh, perfect words for our day today. Why do you stand afar off, O Lord? Where are you? What are you doing? O Lord is, again, the four letters of God's most holy name, Yahweh. Uh, Jesus said that he's that guy. Uh, why do you stand afar off, O Lord? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? Have you ever felt that way in the midst of your life when maybe you were in a very difficult circumstance and you felt like, where's God? How come, he, how come he's not responding? How come he's uh, not showing up? Heaven is silent. Heaven is steeled over. I remember in the days of my mama's dying from cancer, I wondered those things almost every day. Where are you, God? How come you're not answering our prayers? And since then, there have been those times. And I suspect there have been those times for you too when heaven seems steeled over. Why do you stand afar off, O oh Lord? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? Does he seem to be hiding himself today in the midst of this pandemic in which there is this enormous loss of life and more on its way, but there's also so much other loss of jobs and finances and food and security and peace and safety. I love this psalm. He kind of gets in God's face. Do you ever get in God's face? Do you ever say, where are you, Lord? How come you're, you're not showing up? I'm in trouble and you don't seem to be here. Where are you? If this is a Psalm of David, he took great courage in lamenting to the Lord. We go on and now it, it's, it turns to the wicked. In pride, the wicked hotly pursue the afflicted. Uh, we see this in our society and in the world over and over again. In pride, the wicked hotly pursue the afflicted. I think of sex trafficking and uh, the abuse of children and the worldwide abuse of children in sweatshops and so on. 
and we could go through sin after sin after sin, uh, even in the marketplace, in the economy where people will destroy their competition uh, in unfair ways and all those kinds of things. There is a lot of injustice in our world today. Or even in, uh, especially in, in the case of racism. where the proud hotly pursue those who are afflicted. Let them be caught in the plots which they have devised. This is a theme from our psalm yesterday, um, that there are consequences to the things we do, there are consequences to our sin, and they end up being the very trap that we have set. We fall into our own pit. We fall into the hole that we have dug. That same idea. For the wicked boasts of his heart's desire, and the greedy man curses and spurns the Lord. Boy, did I see this growing up in, in junior high and high school where some of the most uh, mean bullies at school were full of pride and boasted of how mean they were and boasted of how cruel they were. And this still goes on in our society and in our world. And the greedy man curses and spurns the Lord. Do you know that greed hardens our heart? Greed uh, makes us blind to the to the cares of other people, but it especially makes us blind and deaf to the Lord. Greed does. Because we're so consumed with wanting to get either money or things or people, so on. The wicked, in the haughtiness of his countenance, have you ever some, seen somebody who is so full of pride it changes their countenance, the way they look? You can just see it on them. I look at somebody and I go, ooh, I suppose some of you may look at me sometimes and see that same haughtiness of his countenance. Uh, the wicked in the haughtiness of his countenance does not seek him, does not seek God. Because he's so about his own pride. All his thoughts are, there is no God. This heralds back to uh, Genesis uh, chapter 3, verse 5. And I'm just going to read it to you real quick. It says, for God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And so that's um, Satan in the guise of a certain serpent speaking to Eve. And he's tempting Eve. He's already got, gotten to question, her to question what God has said to her. And then he gives his promise. For God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. You will be like God. And ever since we've suffered and been seduced by that same lie, uh, one of my favorite teachers, Malcolm Smith, says every generation picks up that lie, brushes it off, knowing that it had failed their parents' generation. But every generation says, we'll, we'll make it work. We'll make the lie work that we are God. We can be in control. Boy, is this world not in control today. We are left with knowing how fragile we are, that we are but earthen vessels, that we are but baked clay, if you will, easily shattered, easily broken, easily destroyed. And notice, all, all his thoughts are, there is no God. And so this psalm all the way through is talking about what uh, one of my friends, Paul Wilson, uh, labeled functional atheism. Uh, we function as if God doesn't exist. All his thoughts are, there is no God. That's our world today, through the teaching of evolution and um, just the rejection of God in so many ways in our culture. Uh, kicking out prayer in schools, kicking out God out of marriage, kicking God out of our schools, and it just goes on down the line. Um, we have become tolerant of so many things uh, in the guise of the, the sin today is being intolerant. And so you need to be tolerant of everything. Everything's okay. Everything goes. But think about this. Does child abuse, is that okay? Is the rape of a child okay? Is the destruction of 66 million unborn babies who have rights, is that okay? This is a devastating philosophy. This is a philosophy, philosophy behind Nazi Germany. This is the philosophy behind the Soviet Union and Stalin killing some, what, uh, 30 to 40 million? Mao killed 49 million. 
We have them all beat. We've killed 66 million. The wickedness and the haughtiness of our countenance does not seek you, Lord. All of our thoughts are there is no God. His ways prosper at all times. So he's saying that the wicked always seem to get away with everything and, and their way, they're making it big, they're doing well. Your judgments are on high, out of sight. So your judgments are so lofty, Lord, we don't even see your judgments. Not us, but the wicked out there. Well, we were. I was certainly once wicked. Still am in many ways safe for the blood of Jesus Christ and the power of his spirit. Your judgments are on high, out of his sight. For As for all of his adversaries, he snorts at them. This is one of those wonderful Hebrew pictures again. This is of a, of a snorting bull. Uh, he snorts at all of his adversaries, ready to take them on, ready for a fight. He says to himself, I will not be moved. Throughout all generations, I will not be in adversity. So I've been alive since 1960, so I've gone through, uh, I'm at the tail end of the baby boomers, and then there's, uh, I forget the next generation, there's the millennials, Gen X, they're calling this next one the Alpha Generation, or some people are calling it Generation C. So now I've lived in the midst of about five generations. So he says to himself, I will not be moved. Nothing can move me. Well, it appears that we're being moved today. Moved to stay home, at least. Throughout all generations, I will not be in adversity. That prideful haughtiness. Where are we today? in prideful haughtiness. The whole world finds itself in adversity. The wor whole world finds itself in affliction, in that wine press of tribulation. And it's, you can't blame God for this. I can't blame God for this. It, it's all of our own doing, all the, all the way down the line. Still, people are not taking this seriously. I read about a pastor who was flipping about this and refused to stay um, according to the social guidelines, went down to New Orleans to preach, caught the virus, and passed away yesterday. Haughtiness, pride. We're told that pride always goes before a fall. And yet don't we all struggle with some measure of pride? I, know, I, I do. I think it's the sin underneath all sin is pride that lie from the Garden of Eden, you shall be as God. I don't need you, God. I, I can do this on my own. I don't need the righteousness which you bring. I can be righteous. You're going to be very pleased with me. I can even create a wonderful devotional life that you're going to be so pleased with me. We're so certain of ourselves, so confident in what we bring to the table, and minimize God. His mouth is full of curses, and deceit and oppression. Under his tongue is mischief and wickedness. Uh, this is verse 7, and it's quoted in by Paul in Romans chapter 3. Those words again, um, I'm going to read them. Uh, I, I don't think we can hear these words enough, because it speaks truth into all of our spirits. Paul writes, as it is written from the Old Testament, meaning the, the law and the Psalms and the writings, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. We saw those words quoted earlier in one of the earlier Psalms. The poison of, of vipers is on their lips. And then here we go. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways, and the way of peace they do not know. There is no fear of God before their eyes. I can't help but think during this week of Judas. I read through Judas' story this morning, looked up Judas's name in a, in a search um, application on my Bible and found every occurrence of it and then read through his story. And This was him. He was full of deceit and oppression. And under his tongue is mischief and wickedness. He used to pilfer, pilfer from the money box. He was the, the bands of disciples. He was their treasure and, and carried the money box. 
And when the poor were there, uh, when Jesus uh, wanted, or when that woman anointed Jesus' head with oil, and uh, Judas was all upset because he said this could have been sold and given to the poor, but really what he was about was he could have pilfered a lot of that from the money box. He was a thief. He was deceitful. And then he betrayed the Lord with a kiss. Well, that passage in Psalm, I mean in Romans that I just read, is talking about the entire planet from the fall until the last day, the day of the Lord. It describes all of us. Our mouths have been full of curses and deceit and oppression. Under our tongues lies mischief and wickedness. He sits in the lurking places of the villages, in the hiding places. He kills the innocent. His eyes stealthily watch for the unfortunate. This picture here is a, is a mock-up of, or a makeup of the Garden of Gethsemane. And I can't help but think of Judas again, lurking, waiting for a way to betray Jesus, and then coming at night with the cohort of soldiers and the, chief, the servants, or the soldiers from the chief priests and their servants. And they confront Jesus, and Judas betrays him with a kiss. And they said, where is um, Jesus? And Jesus says, I am. Literally, it says, I am he, but literally it's I am. And I love it. All the people fall down backwards, down on their backs. But Judas sought out Jesus in the dark places at night. He sits in the lurking places, the villages, and the hiding places. He kills the innocent. His eyes stealthily watch for the unfortunate. I remember coming home from Vandy Camp's Dutch Bakery when I was in college. Got home around midnight, 12:30, and I dropped me off at uh, 45th and Brooklyn Avenue. And my apartment was uh, one street over on, uh, I think it was 43rd in Brooklyn, or no? They dropped me off at 45th and University Ave Avenue, and I had a couple blocks. And so I walked down, and I saw a man. A young man walked down the alley, and so I came around, and it was a church there on the corner, and I saw him come into the bushes right on the corner, right right by where I was walking, and he was uh, waiting for me to come by. And so I stood out in the middle of the street and said, hey, you there, I see you, what do you want? As loud as I could, and he came out, and he says, I thought you were spying on me, and uh, I got out of that one, but... Uh, both literally and metaphorically are there people who sit lurking in the places of villages, in hiding places, who kill the innocent, whose eyes stealthily watch for the unfortunate. He lurks in a hiding place as a lion is in his lair. He lurks to catch the afflicted. He catches the afflicted when he draws him into his net. And now, the psalmist brings in, again, these, uh, they thought pictorially, and so he brings in the image of a lion uh, hiding in this uh, lair, waiting to pounce on uh, prey that walks by or went by. He lurks to catch the afflicted. He catches the afflicted, which he draws him into his nets. Now he's mixing metaphors, which Jewish people did all the time back in that day because they thought pictorially again. And so he catches the afflicted when he draws him into his net. And so he set traps for people. I think about all the traps in our culture that are set for people. This is true in our culture today. All those scams that we are weathering that we've learned not to trust. When you get a phone call from the IRS that says the sheriff is on his way and if you don't pay now, uh, you're going to be arrested. Or um, this is uh, all the scams that are coming about uh, we want to use your bank account, and as a reward, you will get $10 million. Um, there's lots of scams going on. There's lots of this stuff going on, trying to catch people, trying to get their money. He crouches, he bows down in the unfortunate fall by his mighty ones. Now I'm getting the sense that this is no longer just talking about human beings. It's talking about Satan and his cohorts. He crouches, he bows down. And the unfortunate fall by his mighty ones. Well, there are those who are heads of gangs and so on, in the mafia, in organized crime, in uh, street gangs and so on. But sort, Satan also 
he goes around like a roaring lion. Lion, he lurks in hiding in in a hiding place as a lion in his lair. He lurks to catch the afflicted. He catches the afflicted when he draws them into his net. You know, Satan never fights fair. If you are struggling with a malady, even mental illness, he will capitalize on that. If you're struggling with addiction, he'll capitalize on that. He crouches, he bows down, and the unfortunate fall by his mighty ones. He says to himself, God has forgotten. He has hidden his face. He will never see it. Boy, is that, that's the state of our world. We think, well, God isn't watching. Or, as we saw earlier in the psalm, there is no God. What foolishness to think that God has forgotten that he doesn't see that globe and everyone on it. It says he knows the hairs of our head. He has them numbered. Do you not think that he sees every human being on the planet and knows exactly what they're doing? He even knows our thoughts. Uh, Jesus re repeatedly knew the thoughts of those around him. He says to himself, God has forgotten. He has hidden his face. Heaven is steeled over. He's not paying attention. He will never see it. In the New Testament, it says everything will be shouted from the roof, rooftops. Everything hidden will be shouted from the rooftops. And we'll, we will be held accountable for every idle word. I'm thankful that in Christ, we do not come into judgment. We have passed from death to life. Of course, there's still the judgment seat of Christ, which we will be held accountable for every deed we've done. He has hidden his face. He will never see it. Arise, O Lord, O God. Lift up your hand. Do not forget the afflicted. In verse 1, he says, Why do you stand afar off, O Lord? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? Arise, O Lord, O God. Lift up your hand. Do not forget the afflicted. I love this. Arise means Get up off your throne, God. We want you to respond. Heaven seems to have been steeled over. Open, the, open wide the gates of heaven and stand up and do something about the afflicted. I think this language lends itself wonderfully to our epidemic today. We can take boldness and say, stand up, O Lord. Stand up, Yahweh. Stand up, Jesus, O God. Lift up your hand. Act. Lifting up your hand was a sign of power and action. Do not forget the afflicted. In the midst of this pandemic, there are afflicted all around us. Uh, people struggling with homelessness and do not forget the afflicted. Why has a wicked spurned God? He has said to himself, you know, you will not require it. Meaning you won't, you won't require any, um, uh, answering to you, if you will, so that we can live life ignorant of the consequences and not caring about the consequences that follow our actions. You know, sin, God doesn't warn us about sin because, he, because he's a curmudgeon in heaven, not wanting us to have fun. He warns us because of his great love for us. He says, don't do that because it's like a Pandora's box. You open that one up and you're going to have lots of trouble in your life. Well, we don't listen. I remember counseling young people about some of this stuff years and years ago. And they're ignoring the counsel. And I, I counseled them with much grace and love. And some of those young people had to live through very, very difficult lives. And I'm glad to see many of them back. The sense that God will not bring justice. The sense that we can do anything we want as a society and a world, and God's not going to hold us responsible. The blood of millions cries out from the ground. God heard the voice of the blood of, or the voice of Abel's blood crying out to him from, from the ground. 
What does the voice of 66 million children's blood sound like and of over a billion worldwide? What does that sound like to our Lord? You will not require it. Oh, I'm so thankful for the cross and for what we're celebrating, that he is more than just, that he is more than fair. That if we would turn to him and call out to him and say, save me, Jesus. He forgives, already he's forgiven us all of our iniquity and sin. But then he would acquit us, he would justify us, redeem us, purchase. He's already purchased us by his blood, but he offers that free gift of eternal life. But for the believing. To Mary, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me should never die. And that most poignant question. Your device do you... is in airplane mode, so I can't help you with that at the moment. Well, that's my Google for some reason deciding to talk to me. So I love those interruptions. I turned the thing off. Uh, it's in airplane mode, so she can't talk to me. Why has a wicked spurned God? He has said to himself, you, know, you will not require it. You know, the only way to come out from under the judgment of God for our very real wrongdoing, our very real rebellion, our very real sin, is to co come under the umbrella of Jesus Christ, to come into the ark that is Christ, to entrust our lives to him, that he might save us, to believe who he is, that he is the son of God, that he is deity in the flesh, that he is uh, the Messiah, the one who came and, and offered up his life for us on the cross. It goes on and it says, you have seen it. You've beheld mischief and vexation to take it into your hand. The unfortunate com commits himself to you. You've been the helper of the orphan. He cares about orphans and widows. He cares about the downcast and the downtrodden. He cares about the weakest amongst us. Think about who are the weakest amongst us. Even in our weakness in the midst of this pandemic, we can commit our life to him. We can entrust our lives into his hands. Break the arm of the wicked and the evildoer. Seek out his wick wickedness until you find none. That's a bold prayer. Break the arm of the wicked. That means to, the arm, again, is the, is the arm by which we do action. And so he's, he's asking God to render the wicked powerless, unable to cause affliction to other people. And then he says, seek out his wickedness until you find none. What a bold prayer in our world today. Break the arm of the wicked. Seek out wickedness until you find none. And then he gets back to praising God. The Lord is king forever and ever. Meaning the Lord, Yahweh, Jesus, is king forever and ever. He still sits on the throne. He still sits on the throne. He is still sovereign. He still rules. And yet our Lord does not sit just on a seat of judgment. He sits on a throne of grace, a throne of this undeserved, unmerited, kind and generous power to forgive, transform and save broken lives forever and ever. He sits on a throne of grace. It's wise to approach that throne of grace while you have time in your hour of need. Nations have perished from his land. There is nation after nation, which uh, no longer in existence. Uh, their rulers brought to, to nothing. O Lord, you have heard the desire of the humble. You will strengthen their heart. You will incline your ear. Who are truly the humble? The humble aren't the people who are just uh, quiet in their demeanor and uh, not thinking too much of themselves. The humble are those who know how evil they've been, who know that in of themselves we are weak and frail and fickle. We are but earthen vessels. 
We are not God. We have lost that certainty that I can be as God. The humble are those who have developed a, a healthy measure of, of distrust, self-distrust. Who trust in the Lord. You will strengthen their heart. You will incline your ear. That's a wonderful prayer today. Strengthen our heart, Lord. Incline your ear to us. Hear us, O Lord. And then he ends with both a call again to God to vindicate the orphan and the oppress. To vindicate the orphan and the oppress so that man who is of the earth will no longer cause terror. Bring the wicked to justice, Lord. That's not a prayer we, we often pray. We, we pray for grace. We pray for love. But I'm glad that there is justice. I'm glad that there are those who are brought to justice for the evil they do. Uh, we still pray for grace for them. And so this psalm, I think there's a, some very, uh, very apropos request, and it's at the very beginning. Why do you stand afar off, O Lord? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? O oh Lord, you have heard the desire of the humble. You will strengthen their heart. You will incline your ear. So it begins with this call out to God to hear. And it ends with, you will strengthen our hearts. You will incline your ear. Well, thank you for uh, joining me today. It's a very um, harsh psalm in one sense but without justice there is no grace without a deep sense of our sin and who we are in of ourselves in that belief that we are god there is no grace grace only makes sense when we don't deserve it when we know how far we've fallen and how fickle we are so I'd encourage you to do two things today. Read Psalm 10 over again a couple times through if you have time. Read it. And then read Romans 3, verses 10 through 18. Again, that's Romans 3, 10 through 18. And let the Lord speak into your spirit who we really are in of ourselves. We need him in every way in our life. I know that full well. Let's close with prayer. Father, I thank you for this psalm. There is a lot of evil in our world. And even though I, I prefer to speak on grace, there are times when we need to acknowledge the oppressed and the afflicted and the orphans and the widows and those who are weak amongst us. Remember their cause. Stand in the gap between them and God and plead with God to stand up and hear us. And so, God, in the middle of this pandemic, we ask that you would stand up, O oh Lord. That you would come. That you would speak that word of peace into this storm. Again, I pray for all those family who have lost loved ones and for those who are yet to lose loved ones, that you would bring great comfort and that deep knowledge of your love in spite of the loss, Lord. And in our lives, Lord, by your Holy Spirit, continue your good work. Even in the midst of this, using the wine press that we're in, you are transforming our lives from one degree of glory to another into the very image of Christ. And this comes from the Lord, who is a spirit. So, Father, I simply pray right now that you would convict the world of their sin and us as well, Lord. And that you would fill us with an extraordinary measure of your spirit, of your spirit's power, the fruit of the spirit, the gifts of the spirit. Lord, we have not because we ask not. Teach us to ask for your spirit. 
I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you for joining me today. Um, we'll be back with uh, Psalm 11, another psalm uh, of like kind. We have a few more psalms like this, and I decided it would be a good discipline just to keep going through one at a time and not just pick my favorites, um, because then we're allowing the whole counsel of God to speak to us. I hope you heard the Holy Spirit in uh, his word today, not in my poor words, but in his rich words. Hope we'll see you tomorrow. Stay safe. Stay home as necessary. Only go out if, if it's absolutely necessary. Um, I love you all. Uh, remember that we are children of God. We are chosen, holy, and dearly loved. We are the apple of his eye. Thanks for joining me today. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. Amen.